The following program is in no way intended to replace your doctor's advice or treatment program, nor should it be used as a tool for the purpose of self-diagnosis. Welcome to your health, your choice. Uh, tonight we are going to be covering the topic of uh, high blood pressure, hypertension. Uh, we have covered this before, but I thought um, we needed to revisit uh, some of the key areas. And um, it's a, uh, like diabetes um, and uh, heart disease, etc. It's a rapidly developing field, and it's one that we need to constantly, as doctors, as healthcare professionals, update ourselves uh, with the new information coming through, and also uh, try and pass on that information to. Uh, patients. So Your Health, Your Choice, uh, it's a program really designed to give you uh, good scientific uh, information in an easily understandable form, uh, format, and then your health is your choice. And especially here tonight with the hypertension, um, it is indeed your choice how you deal with uh, borderline or high blood pressure. Uh, I just want to rec uh, remind you that these uh, programs are pre-recorded now. and. Um, we are still open for you to sending in questions on 482-4269, uh, 482-4269. It's uh, better if you WhatsApp your questions to that number. And um, we, uh, on the first showing of the program or second showing, we sometimes will be on Facebook Live as well. And I try to have a presence there to answer questions. That's also the number, of course, for my um, medical office. So uh, let's um, get into this topic of um, hypertension. It's, of course, a very, very common problem. It's one of the most common uh, presenting medical problems to general practitioners and to uh, internists, et cetera. And in my cohort of patients who are mainly diabetics, um, hypertension often uh, is a co comorbid presentation or a feature that we deal with. So very often people have diabetes, hypertension, and high cholesterol, and of course, um, abdominal adiposity, which all goes into uh, forming what we call a metabolic syndrome. So um, let, let's go into our slide, uh, slide two uh, today. And uh, the question is um, uh, simply, have you uh, checked your blood pressure regularly or have you checked your blood pressure recently? And the second statement is extremely important. Um, no symptoms does not mean that you have uh, a normal blood pressure. Now, I just want to emphasize that the no symptoms does not mean that you have a normal blood pressure. And I know the, um, slide, the circle in uh, the dark circle at, at the left-hand side of the slide is um, probably a bit dramatic. Hypertension, HTN is hypertension, is a silent killer. So we can just come off that slide. Uh, so the, the salient points there is if you are, I would say, over 30 to 35, you should be doing an occasional uh, blood pressure check. Now, um, unlike the uh, diabetes that we often deal with, where we send you to a lab to have a blood test done, uh, uh, blood pressure readings are really, um, can be really done at home. And in fact, let me just say this right now, and I'll repeat it maybe later on. The latest guidelines from NICE, which is the National Institute for Clinical Excellence, uh, based in the UK, is that we should be encouraging patients, if they have high blood pressure, or if they come into our offices and we record a high blood pressure, and in fact, uh, the guidelines are now that we should be doing at least about three blood pressure readings in a consultation, uh, one on each arm, and then repeat it in one of the arms, and then take an average of those three readings. But the latest guidelines on blood pressure, um, uh, or di even the diagnosis of hypertension, and I'll give you the figures in a, in, in a few minutes, is that we should be encouraging patients, if, they, if we record a high blood pressure reading in the office, to do home blood pressure readings for seven days, morning and evening, discard the first day's readings, and then take an average of the next six days, which is roughly 12 readings. And that will give you a fair idea. And the blood pressure machines we encourage you to have at home is those with um, the cuff around the arm, not the, the ones around the wrist. Um, the ones around the arm are slightly more 
accurate, but taking it for six days, uh, seven days, discarding the first day's readings, and then taking an average twice a day, doing the readings morning and evening, and taking the readings, an average of those 12 readings. The other uh, thing that has become very popular, especially in the UK and the US, is ambulatory blood pressure measurement. So we send someone either to a cardiologist or to a um, uh, so, uh, uh, cardiology lab where they can uh, put a little machine onto you and it does your blood pressure every hour of the day for at least 24 to 48 hours. And then that can be downloaded and we can look at what was the average blood sugar over 48 hours. Uh, now, why is that all so important? It's because very often we have what is called white coat hypertension or um, the, uh, just where well, we don't wear white coats in Trinidad very often. Um, it's more a US thing. But it's really the idea of coming into a doctor's office and the blood pressure seems to go up. And I, I see, you know, almost every time in my office, people's blood pressures are much higher than when it's recorded at home. So blood pressure, hypertension is a silent problem. Now, very much like diabetes. So, so you could very often have two problems overlapping, hypertension and diabetes, and you have absolutely no symptoms at all. And we will come to some of the uh, problems that can result as a, if, if your blood pressure goes undiagnosed for many years. We can go to slide three. Uh, slide three, and HTN again on, on the left-hand side, that's hypertension. Uh, the sad figures is that less than one in five people are under good control. And every 20 to 10 millimeters per mercury of the blood pressure being above what it should be, and I will give you those figures in a minute. Um, so if your blood pressure is higher than it should be, it, re it can result in twice the recorded amounts of deaths from heart disease and stroke. So HD is heart disease or stroke. So uh, I want you to get that figure in your, in your mind that, that less than one in five people are under good blood pressure control. And for every 20 systolic, 10 diastolic, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain what the systolic and diastolic blood pressures are. Um, you increase your risk from heart disease, death from heart disease or stroke. And on the uh, right-hand side of the slide, you see that uncontrolled hypertension causes premature death. It increases the risk of heart attack, stroke, kidney failure, blindness, and other complications. So I want, just want to re repeat that. Why is <clears throat> uncontrolled hypertension so important. It can lead to heart attacks, strokes, um, kidney disease, and, and blindness. So I will, I'll explain some of those now. So uh, what is hypertension? Basically, high blood pressure is uh, a resistance against which your heart is having to pump uh, against. So your heart is really a pumping organ, and it's made up of muscles. So it's, you have the left side of the heart, where oxygenated blood comes in from the lungs. Um, you have the, right, the left atrium and then the left ventricle. And the left ventricle is really the, the pumping, the main pumping site of the heart. And every time it contracts, it's pumping blood out to circulate around the body to give all your tissues oxygenated blood. For various reasons, sometimes narrowing of the arteries, sometimes inflammation of the arteries, but many times we don't know the cause of hypertension. It's called essential hypertension. And uh, the, the result is your heart is having to pump at a uh, work at a higher uh, work level and the muscles become enlarged. The blood supply then to the heart is um, sometimes not sufficient, especially if you have atherosclerosis, which is a buildup of plaque in your arteries. And you can have parts of the heart muscle so over a long period of time. Hypertension can result in enlargement of the heart, enlargement of the heart muscle, requiring more oxygenated blood to the heart muscle itself. And if those vessels, those coronary arteries are blocked or partially blocked, you can end up with a heart attack. And we also said, um, of course, uh, stroke, because with high blood pressure, again, uh, you can have um, both types of strokes, ischemic, but of course, the hemorrhagic strokes, where you get an artery being um, ruptured, um, especially if there's an aneurysm, a weakness in one of the arteries in the brain. If your blood pressure is extremely high, you can have um, hemorrhaging 
a hemorrhagic stroke, which is really a catastrophic event, as, a, as opposed to an ischemic stroke, which is often a slowly evolving event. And kidney disease, many people um, often attribute kidney failure to uh, diabetes, and, and that is true. Diabetes is one of the leading causes of uh, kidney failure, uh, chronic kidney disease, but hypertension. And of course, we know that there's a little bit of a divide in the ethnic, um, the prevalence of, of diabetes and hypertension. Hypertension is slightly more prevalent in the Afro-Caribbean population, diabetes in the Indo-Caribbean population. But the reality is now, with the ethnic mix in our country, there's an overlap of those two diseases. So very often we see both diabetes and hypertension present in the Indo-Caribbean and, and Afro-Caribbean population. But kidney disease is one of the common causes. Hypertension, some people don't, under, they don't uh, know actually that hypertension can affect your eyes. Um, you can uh, get papilledema, which is swelling of the optic disc. You can have um, hemorrhages at the back of the eye, um, flame-shaped hemorrhages. So hypertension and diabetes, poorly controlled diabetes. I always tell patients, poorly controlled diabetes and hypertension is one of the most uh, toxic uh, combinations you can have. And, and, and we know that, you know, you can have relatively poorly controlled diabetes, but if your blood pressure is well controlled, you have a much better outcome than those with both problems presenting uh, to a medical doctor. So uh, we're going to go on to uh, slide four. Um, slide four. And um, unfortunately, most people with high blood pressure simply do not know they have it. And uh, these are American figures, but I don't think it will be any different to uh, for us here in Trinidad. One in four men have hypertension, one in four. And the next slide, slide five, um, uh, for women, again, most people with high blood pressure uh, don't know they have it, and one in five women may have hypertension. So those figures are um, quite startling. And it means that a lot of people are walking around and they're oblivious of the fact that their blood pressures may be uh, just slightly elevated or might be extremely elevated. So you remember the first slide we, we showed um, said that mo most people with hypertension will have no symptoms at all. So and this is where the common misconception is. People think if they have high blood pressure, they will have headaches, stiffness of the neck, um, blurring of the vision, the, the, the two common ones, and very often I have patients coming in with me, ringing and saying they want an urgent appointment because they have a severe headache or they have um, uh, neck stiffness. Uh, your blood pressure usually would have to be extremely high to have those symptoms. And of course, if, and I had this situation uh, a few weeks, maybe two or three months ago, someone coming to me with um, uh, extremely high blood pressure and headaches and uh, uh, we tried to bring the blood pressure down, but eventually he was hospitalized and uh, it ended up with a CT scan showing that he had uh, a small bleed in the brain. Thankfully, the bleed was not too large and he's um, recovering. So one in four men can have, un can have hypertension. Uh, many of them will be undiagnosed. One in, four, one in five women will have hypertension and many of those are undiagnosed. Now, uh, so this is a typical now divide between uh, men and women. Women tend to go to their doctors more often. That's the reality. Um, one, I think it's something about being a male, <laughs> testosterone driven, I often say uh, to wives when they come in and they literally drag their husbands through the door. Um, there's something about testosterone that makes us think we are invincible and we are not going to uh, fall to hypertension, diabetes, cancer, et cetera. Um, so I, I, you know, show some empathy when men come in and I congratulate them for coming in um, because the last thing a man wants is he comes into a doctor, his blood pressure is high, he might have a poor lifestyle and he ends up being told off. Uh, that does nothing to motivate that patient. Uh, uh, you know, what we should do is try and come alongside that patient, uh, show empathy, and try to encourage that patient to start on a journey to better health. Now, I'm going to show you, I think it's slide six. Um, we may have to go to a break in a few minutes, but slide six. Now, th th this is a little bit confusing because there are two sets of guidelines. 
This is the American Cardiac um, College and the American Heart Association. Uh, they define a normal blood pressure as less than 120 over 80, and an elevated blood pressure as above uh, 130 over 80. So they, they define hypertension as stage one and stage two, systolic 130 to 139, or diastolic 80 to 89, and uh, uh, the stage two, uh, the systolic as above 140 and above, one, uh, above 90. Now, so just want to come off that. Um, because that is going to be a little bit confusing, and I think the next slide, which I'll show um, in a minute or two, maybe after our break, um, but, but let me just explain to you um, the, the systolic blood pressure. So the top figure, um, very often patients ask me, uh, Dr. Khan, which is the more important figure? And I often say to patients that both figures are important, the systolic and the diastolic, because the systolic blood pressure it's a measure of the pressure of the heart, the left side of the heart, pumping blood out of the heart. So, so the systolic blood pressure is the resistance against which the heart is having to work to get oxygenated blood out of the heart. And very often we can have isolated systolic blood pressure, systolic hypertension, sorry, especially in the elderly. But then the diastolic figure is a measure of how well the heart is refilling. So you have two phases of the heart. You have the systolic phase where heart, the blood is pumping blood out to the tissues, oxygenated blood. And then you have the blood coming back to the heart, uh, to the, the right side of the heart. And the right side of the heart has to relax to allow blood to come back into the heart. And there are various conditions, and diabetes is one of them, where you can get stiffness of the muscle. It's almost like a cardiomyopathy, a restrictive cardiomyopathy. So you have various types of the big cardiomyopathy. You can have a dilated cardiomyopathy. You can have a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is um, enlargement of the muscles. But then you can have a restrictive cardiomyopathy. And diabetes is one of those conditions, sarcoidosis, some other medical conditions, that can lead to stiffness of the muscle, and it does not relax sufficiently well. Right, we have to go to our first break. Um, this is your health, your choice. We're going to come back in a minute or two and continue our discussion on hypertension. TV on ACT and The Voice. You ding dong, you're supposed to be watching for cases. You have to land and relax, Jimmy Light. I it's... am certainly. I have, I've often thought of Muppy here as about the cutest little fellow around. Uh, uh, Fraggle is most assuredly the best of all possible creatures. Yep, 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 yep. But remember, he who laughs, 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 laughs. No harm will come to you here. My name is Michael. And you are in heaven. Learn. Now, come on, try it. Well, okay, if you say so. <laughs> How is that tasty? Saturday mornings just got a whole lot better on ACTN The Voice. Welcome back to Your Health, Your Choice. Uh, we want to remind you, we are, uh, these are pre-recorded programs. So if you have questions, as many of you do, you can WhatsApp your questions on 482-4269, uh, or you can email me on claude underscore khan at yahoo.co.uk. Um, so we're talking about hypertension, high blood pressure. We have made the points tonight that uh, it's a very common problem. One in four men may have hypertension, one in five women, and very often it goes undiagnosed because uh, many people are under the assumption that when you have high blood pressure, you will have headaches, or stiff neck, et cetera, that's not actually true. 
Um, in fact, the most common symptom of hypertension is nothing at all. You feel totally well, but the problem is we show that it can cause heart disease, it can cause uh, kidney problems, strokes, um, blindness. So it, we, we need to be encouraging patients, especially if there's a family history and there are other risk factors to measuring their blood pressure. Now, I showed a slide just before we went to the break that was a little bit confusing because uh, it showed you various figures. But uh, slide eight, I think, is the figure that we, or the guidelines we want to go to. These are the nice guidelines. Uh, slide eight. High blood, uh, no, the slide just before that, Josh. Yeah, thank you. Um, so high blood pressure, know your numbers. Um, so if your blood pressure is uh, 140 over 90 or higher, you probably have high blood pressure and you should act now. So 140 over 90 is, uh, are the figures that we are looking at. Um, so I just want to come off that slide um, and talk about that a little bit. So the figures have been going back and forth a bit and, and people end up getting a little bit confused. Um, some people say 130 over 80, some people say 135, 130, 135 over 85 or 80. Um, the NICE guidelines actually says that 140 over 90, but if, you do it, if you're doing ambulatory blood pressure measurements, which is uh, the 24-hour, 48-hour blood pressure measurement, um, 135 over 80 is, uh, or above is considered um, hypertension. And, uh, but, but in terms of the measurements in the office, so again, if someone comes in with a blood pressure, say, of 150 over 90, I would most times not rush to start that person on an antihypertensive. I may give some lifestyle advice, especially if the patient is uh, overweight, um, sedentary, um, uh, some dietary advice. But then I would encourage that patient to do home blood pressure measurements. And that's where um, having a meter at home for those who are um, diagnosed with high blood pressure in the office, we then say, look, you probably should get a, uh, one of the home meters, which are not very expensive. And as I said in the first part of the program, we now encourage patients to keep, just as we ask patients to keep um, a blood sugar diary, we are now asking patients to keep a blood pressure diary. And uh, in the early stages, twice a day, as I said, morning and evening, and uh, a lot of people notice that their blood pressures are some, sometimes highest on a morning and not in an evening. And that again is, is part of the dawn phenomena where in the early hours of the morning, your body is getting ready for the activities of the day and you begin to spill out things like cortisol, uh, cortisol adrenaline, um, your testosterone levels for men are highest in the early hours of the morning and the blood pressures can be highest in the morning. That's why, if I forget to say this to you, the new trend in, in giving blood pressure tablets is to take it on evenings or at nights because we know uh, quite well that blood pressures tend to spike at two, three in the morning. And that's why if uh, in my days gone by when <clears throat> working in the hospital, very often at two, three in the morning, that's when people would come in with heart attacks, strokes, etc. cetera. So 140 over 90. However, there's a proviso there. If you have other medical conditions, so if I have someone with diabetes and protein in the urine, what is called microalbuminuria, or macroalbuminuria, then I'm going to try and get their blood pressures down to 130 over 80 or even 120 over 80. If someone has uh, hypertension and diabetic eye disease, diabetic retinopathy, again, I'm not going to be happy with 140 over 90. I'm going to try and get them down to 130 over 80 or even 120 over 80. Of course, there's a fine line here because um, uh, we talk about a J-curve where if we drop people's blood pressures too low, um, below, say, 115 over 70, down to 110 over 60, especially in the elderly, you can have um, negative effects as a result of that. So there have been some trials that have shown that if we drop people's blood pressures too low, you actually increase morbidity and mortality. Morbidity, by that I mean um, people can have syncopal attacks, can have um, dizziness because the blood pressure falls when they stand from a sitting position, et cetera. Um, so um, we, 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 the, the slide uh, nine, slide nine, I think it's slide nine, yes. Um, now this is a little bit difficult to see, um, but uh, it, it really categorizes hypertension into primary, 
secondary. Um, uh, then we talk about um, isolated systolic hypertension or isolated diastolic hypertension. Then we have the, the mixed var variety. We have white coat. Uh, thank you, Josh. That's, that's great. Um, so we have the mixed um, hypertension, and th that says 130 over 80, but remember we are going with 140 over 90. And uh, then you have white coat or elevated or office readings um, of hypertension. And um, then you have mask hypertension, elevated only out of the office. And that's a, a relatively um, unusual one. So um, let's just come off that slide for a minute. So um, hypertension can be categorized. And I'm going to talk a little bit about primary and secondary hypertension. And those are the two main areas we look at. Um, of course, you, you have hypertension in pregnancy, and I hope that we'll have some time to come into that as well and talk about that, because very um, often uh, people, uh, women may have completely normal blood pressures outside of pregnancy, but in pregnancy, the blood pressures start going up, and you can have something called preeclampsia, and um, what we try and prevent is eclampsia, where um, it ends up being a life-threatening condition. So we can go on now to slide 10, um, and uh, slide 10 talks about what we call resistant hypertension. So um, I, I'm just going to leave that slide up for a minute or two. Um, so how do we define resistant hypertension? Resistant hypertension is when you have high blood pressure not controlled with three drugs, including one being a diuretic, which is a tablet that causes you to pass um, more urine. And um, it's a, a resistant hypertension is when it's controlled with four or more drugs, including one diuretic. So um, that is, uh, I just want to come off that and, and talk about that for a minute. Now, the reason I wanted to just spend a minute or two more on this resistant hypertension is, uh, I understand there's a lot of uh, skepticism about drugs. Big Pharma, as it's called, and especially with the COVID pandemic, um, and we are recording this program at a time when there's a resurgent, resurgence of COVID-19 cases in Trinidad. Unfortunately, we thought the cases, that cases had uh, flattened, and we have seen a resurgence, um, and uh, there are you know, lots of concerns. But together with um, the, the whole COVID-19, I think there's been a proliferation of all the conspiracy theories about big pharma, um, about uh, various uh, billionaires uh, pushing the vaccination uh, agenda, um, uh, all kinds of you know, stories. I just wanna ask you to be careful and be discerning when you read something on Facebook, social media, before you share it or before you send it around. You know, I've seen some crazy things been, uh, been circulated about, about COVID-19, for example, about gargling with warm water or um, lime and, and, and all kinds of things. And sometimes when we respond as doctors, people think we're being arrogant. Well, you know, I, I often say to people, I would not dream of telling a, an engineer how to build a bridge or someone who's working on a platform how to do drilling. I, I, I just wouldn't dream to tell someone how to do that job because I simply am not trained in that area. I'm not just say, I'm not saying that uh, only healthcare professionals can give medical advice, but as a healthcare professional, as a medical doctor, one of the things we are trained to do is to be able to look at data and discern whether this is reliable data or not. So just coming back to um, uh, uh, resistant hypertension, a lot of patients come in and if they are not controlled on one tablet, they often do not want to go on a second or third tablet because of the fear. And very often, the first question I'm asked is, uh, Dr. Khan, what damage is this going to do to my kidneys? What damage is this going to do to my heart or to my organs? Patients never ask me, and I could say this across board. Maybe there are one or two exceptions. Some of you, my patients might be looking and might say, well, I've asked you that the question I'm about to see. But very few patients ever ask me, Dr. Khan, what is the damage that poorly controlled diabetes will do to my organ? I pause for emphasis. 
very few patients ever ask me, Dr. Khan, what damage will poorly controlled high blood pressure do to my organ? I want to suggest to you there's a lot of fake medicine on social media, on Facebook. There are a lot of people putting stuff out there, and it is not scientifically based. So when patients come in and ask me, um, can I use garlic, or can I use turmeric, or can I use, I say, you know, fine, if you want to use those things, I have no problem. But I do not have the scientific data to support how efficacious those interventions are. So I want you to understand, I'm not against herbal remedies. I'm not against some of the natural remedies. Or if, you know, if you want to take um, garlic and if you want to take um, uh, turmeric, all those things, in the years ahead, we may have the data. And of course, I am aware that big farmers, we call it, will not put billions of dollars into researching these things. We know that. But as it stands now, as a medical doctor, I have to practice medicine on the basis of science on the basis of double-blind placebo-controlled trials. And we know that uncontrolled resistant hypertension can cause all the problems we talked about. Heart disease, heart attacks, strokes, kidney disease, blindness. It can cause peripheral, contribute to peripheral vascular disease and, 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 and all the other problems we talked about. So very often with resistant hypertension, we have to end up putting people on three or even four different drugs. Now, this is where combination therapy comes in. So fortunately, um, we are now um, in a situation where we can put people on one drug that has three drugs in it. I, I'm not gonna call names because it's gonna be unfair if I call one um, company's drug and, and not mention another one. But there are several companies now that have um, three drugs in one tablet so I can give my patient one tablet, and if it's a resistant hypertension, we often see good control, especially we know that the, um, there's good evidence that the Afro-American and the Afro-Caribbean population um, uh, respond better uh, to calcium channel blockers and sometimes diuretics than to ACE inhibitors and ARBs. Now, I know those are big names, but those are some of the common um, blood pressure tablets. Um, I'm aware that we might have to go to our second break soon, um, but um, I think this is slide 13 um, on, on evaluation. Slide 13 on evaluation. Um, if we have to go to a break, we, we will do so. But um, I th just a slide. Okay, we'll, we'll stick. Yes. So, so evaluation, we, we look at the, taking a careful history, doing a physical e examination, and doing investigations. So, so a careful history, physical examination, and investigation. So I come off, um, we'll come off that slide. I'll come back to primary essential hypertension. We may have to do that after a second break. Um, but let me just uh, break down this. So when a patient comes in with high blood pressure, or say they may have high blood pressure, I don't just put on the cuff and, and start measuring the blood pressure. What we try and do is take a careful history of what are those patients, what is that patient's risk factors uh, for hypertension. Is there a family history? Um, is there diabetes? Are they, and, and what are the other comorbid factors? Um, are they smokers? Have they had high cholesterol in the past? Um, so are they sedentary? What is their eating pattern like? So you take a careful history so you're able to give a tailored advice to this patient. Then you do a physical examination. And of course, the physical examination will be the blood pressure measurement. And as I said, the advice now from NICE, the NICE guidelines is three blood pressure measurements, one in the right arm, one in the left arm, and again, probably back in the right. People ask me, you know, is it, um, which arm is more appropriate, the right or the left? It really doesn't matter. But if you have a significant difference, now this is important, if you have a significant difference in blood pressure readings in both arms, after doing it two or three times, that is a reason for further investigations for cardiovascular disease, because you could very well have a blockage in one of the arteries, and, and uh, if there's a difference, we often used to talk about something called co coarctation of the aorta, leading to a different blood pressure in the left and the right arm. But, but really, it, we now know that a significant difference, which is really about a 10 to 20 millimeter per mercury difference between um, both arms, 
um, in, in the systolic or diastolic, then that patient should be investigated. And most times I would do a blood sugar reading as well. We would do the patient's weight. Um, a waist circumference is important. And then, of course, uh, doing an auscultation to listen to the patient's heart um, and um, lungs, um, feeling the abdomen, um, and then looking at the peripheral pulses, et cetera. And then, of course, investigations are important. Now, if the blood pressure is extremely high, so if um, someone comes with a blood pressure, say, of 180 over 120 or 200 over 100, um, then I may initiate treatment immediately. If it's around 150 over 90, 150 over 80, even up to 160 over 90, I may send that patient for some investigations first. So it's the, the basic investigations are blood testing. I would uh, do um, uh, the kidney function, liver function, lipid profile, uh, thyroid function. I routinely would do a HbA1c, fasting blood sugar on patients. I probably will do a urine test for protein. Um, those are some of the basic blood tests, thyroid function, I think I mentioned. And then um, we would then probably, after the second or third visit, go on to other investigations. Okay, we have to go to our second and final break, and then we will return with your health, your choice. Drew a new line and we're on the wrong side, so we have to go. I can't stand up. You can't stand up, little buddy. You really can't stand up? You're standing on my hand. Bed sheet wearing sand crawling. Let me. Got me as a friend, you don't really need an enemy. <laughs> Thank you. George! What about my coat? Oh, it's very nice. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to Your Health, Your Choice. We are on the final segment of the program. We are talking about high blood pressure, hypertension. Uh, remind you again, it's a pre-recorded program. So if you have questions, which you may have, you can WhatsApp us on 482-4269, 482-4269. That's also the number for medical appointments and for the church if you need further information about the Anaposis Chapel or you can email us on um, claude underscore khan at yahoo.co.uk. Our website is also there www.anaposiscommunity.com. So we have talked about uh, doing a proper, uh, taking a proper history, doing a physical examination. So, so let me just add, the physical examination um, means that we examine the patient. And that's why I'm a little bit cautious when people tell me they went to someone and uh, they were diagnosed with high blood pressure, no investigations were done, and something was taken off the shelves and given to them and uh, told that they should take this. That's not how we deal with hypertension. Um, how we practice medicine, the art of doing medicine, and I know some of you may think I'm going on about this, but the art of doing medicine is proper history taking, physical examination, investigations. So I said we would send people for the basic blood test. I may see the patient again fairly soon after that if the blood pressure was high, look at the blood testing. And of course, if we discover diabetes with hypertension, we are much more aggressive in treating the hypertension. If we find that the cholesterol is high and the patient is over 40, I would do a cardiovascular risk analysis, which is a cardiac risk calculator from uh, the American Heart Association that I have on my um, my smartphone. So these smartphones are not just for WhatsApping and sending messages. I actually use it in my medical consultation because I can do a cardiovascular risk analysis. And if that risk analysis is uh, above 10%, 
then definitely. Now, there are different risk calculators, uh, the one that's been used in, in the UK is slightly different to the one that's been used um, by the American Heart Association. But in reality, if uh, the um, cardiovascular risk is above 10 percent, and we, we need to be treating the hypertension aggressively, and if the cardiovas cardiovascular risk is above 7.5 percent, we probably should be putting that patient on a statin. And uh, subsequently, what I may do is send that patient for an ECG, maybe an echocardiogram. The echocardiogram especially is very important because what we are looking for is end-stage um, end organ damage uh, or target organ damage, TOD it's called. And if you have target organ damage, um, so if you find that you do an echocardiogram and you have a left ventricular hypertrophy, the left ventricle is enlarged, or uh, if you find that the, the right side of the heart is not, um, it's showing a restrictive cardiomyopathy. Um, if you do the renal function and it shows um, uh, albuminuria, protein in the urine, um, you, you may, might be looking at an organ damage, um, or target or organ damage, kidney damage, or heart damage. Um, also, examination of the eyes to so someone with hypertension should be sent for, uh, to an ophthalmologist uh, for an eye check because, again, if there are signs of um, a hypertension at the back of the eyes, it means that we have to. So, what I'm saying here is sending patients for these investigations will give us an idea how aggressive we need to be in treating the hypertension. So, if there's no end organ damage, we might be satisfied with 140 over 90. But if we have diabetes, we have albumin, albuminuria or microalbuminuria. We have evidence of um, eye damage, uh, or if we have done a CT scan and we have seen that the patient may have had mild ischemic events, we then want to be much more aggressive in treating the hypertension and trying to get that patient down to 130 over 80 or so. Um, now, I may not have time to say this, but bear in mind, if someone comes in with a very high blood pressure, um, we, we, we want to bring that blood pressure down slowly. We, want, we don't want to be too aggressive in the way we bring that blood pressure down. Um, but if I don't get time to cover that in this um, program, I may bring back some of the slides on the, on the next program. So um, slide 15, I think it was, where we were going to talk about essential hypertension. Right. So this is primary, or what is called essential hypertension. Um, basically, it's a, a big way of saying we simply don't know um, what the reason is. As people get older, the blood pressure uh, starts going up. Um, so we very often have isolated systolic hy hypertension. That's the top figure being high. Obesity, especially abdominal ab uh, adiposity. And I, um, those of you who are on my Facebook uh, timeline would see that I often post things, medical articles, and I did one on abdominal adiposity recently, just um, over the weekend. Familial, if there's a family history of hypertension. Um, you need to check on salt intake, alcohol intake, um, physical inactivity, and um, reduce nephron numbers. So that kind of comes under more secondary hypertension. But the uh, first uh, six, uh, those that are shown there, um, are very often um, contributing to primary or essential hypertension. So we'll just come off that slide for a minute. So if we're going to treat uh, primary or essential hypertension, we, we, we want to be, be looking at other factors that might be contributing to it. And uh, so if the patient is overweight, um, as we are putting people on drug therapy, we want to be advising them to be exercising, um, trying to lose some weight. Now, of course, we, we need to be sensitive when we talk about weight because we know that, and I've said this often on this program, uh, many patients um, have tried their best to lose weight and they find it extremely difficult. Um, being overweight is not just a choice. You know, we often make people feel guilty um, about overeating. And yes, some people do eat, eat badly. But if you look at family lines, very often mother and father might be overweight and all the children are overweight. And you compare it to other family lines where um, both parents are normal weight are quite slim and their children are quite slim. And when you look at the eating pattern of those children, they may not be eating particularly healthily, but they, they keep their weight. Now, it has to do something with genetics, something with metabolism, and then with lifestyle. 
So there's a sort of interlocking uh, circles here where weight is concerned. Genetics, uh, me metabolism, and of course, lifestyle. So we want to encourage patients uh, not to think about what their ideal body weight might be. Because if someone's body mass index is 35 to 40, uh, goodness gracious, don't try and tell them to get down to a BMI of 23 or 24. If they could lose 10 to 15%, now remember those figures, 10 to 15% of their body weight over six months to eight months. So if someone is, say, 200 pounds, um, and, and it depends on what their height is, but say they are five foot, um, five feet, uh, seven inches, the ideal body weight might be, let's just say, 160. I'm not going to ask that patient to lose 40 pounds in one month. I'm going to say, look, try and lose about 10% of your body weight over the next six months. If you can lose 15 to 20 pounds over six months, you have done extremely well. And, and just that intervention with dietary changes can often bring people's blood pressures back to normal. That's why people who are very overweight and who have had gastric bypass surgery, um, very often we um, see that their blood pressures come down, their blood sugars come down, etc. Now we have about 10 minutes left, and I just want to go on to slide 16. Um, uh, slide 16 uh, shows us um, on uh, secondary hypertension. And uh, um, so, so these are some of the causes of what we call secondary hypertension, uh, which are um, chronic kidney disease, so CKD. So some over-the-counter medications you have to be careful about. Um, so um, there was something with St. John's wort some, some, some years ago. Um, but you, you just have to be careful, some of the um, herbal stuff that you might be taking. Um, chronic kidney disease. So if someone has chronic kidney disease, that's a secondary cause of hypertension. Um, renal RVHTN call is a big way of talking about narrowing of the arteries leading to the kidneys, renal vascular hypertension. So if you have renal artery stenosis, and this can only be picked up, well, you, very rarely, if you put a, a stethoscope over the abdomen, the kidney area, the abdomen, you may hear brui, which is a kind of whooshing sound, um, but that's quite rare. The way we pick up uh, renovascular hypertension is um, by doing a Doppler uh, ultrasound of the kidneys, and you may see that the renal arteries are narrowed. Um, the next one, Takayasu, is a, a, a condition, an inflammatory condition. I'm not going to spend much time on that. OSC, very important, obstructive sleep apnea. That, that is extremely common conditions. Now, the other conditions are not so common. Pheochromocytoma, we learn about it in medical school days. Hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism and hyperparathyroidism are more common conditions on Cushing's syndrome. So um, we can just come off that slide. We only have about 10 more minutes. Um, so uh, if, we, if we suspect that, and most times we would not rush in to do ultrasounds or um, a lot of um, endocrino endocrinology investigations to try and diagnose um, parathyroidism or uh, Cushing syndrome. Um, but if we are treating someone for hypertension and we have done all the lifestyle changes and um, it's uh, resistant, then uh, especially in younger patients, so if someone is maybe under 35 or 30 and comes in with an extremely elevated high blood pressure, those are certainly candidates that um, you should be uh, focusing on to uh, investigate for um, secondary causes of the hypertension. So um, uh, let me just uh, go to slide 17 quickly. Um, th these are the non-pharmacological interventions, which I know most of you would like to see. Uh, the next slide, the non-pharmacological. -pharma so dietary salt restriction, salt restriction. So restricting your salt intake, low salt intake, and Seeing a dietitian can give you exact advice about that, but that can lead to a good fall in blood pressure. Um, actually, potassium supplementation, um, eating the right types of fruit. Now, of course, if you have chronic kidney disease, you have to be careful about this because we restrict potassium in those with um, uh, chronic kidney disease. Weight loss. So for every one kilogram of weight loss, you can reduce your blood pressure by one to two millimeters per mercury. Dietary approaches, sometimes it's something called a DASH approach um, to stop hypertension. Exercise, 
very important and limiting alcohol intake, limiting alcohol intake. So we just come off that slide because I know time is running away with us. Um, so those are the non-pharmacological um, uh, ways we can intervene and together with, of course, drug therapy. So you have to choose your patients. Now, you know, alcohol is often underestimated by patients. So most patients, when they come in and I ask them about alcohol intake, they will say minimal. But from the time someone says, yes, I drink alcohol, my um, a, a sort of red flag goes up because most patients will say it's minimal. And when somebody says, yes, you then need to take a careful um, history trying to calculate the number of units of alcohol. And we now know that for both men and women, the recommended um, intake is um, no more than 14 units of alcohol per week, uh, 14 units of alcohol. And of course, we know one carib um, is um, about 1 to 1.5 units. And of course, if you're having scotch and um, uh, punchin, God forbid, um, that could be two to three units with every drink you're taking. So it's very easy to overestimate, uh, underestimate the alcohol intake. Now we are coming to an end. We, we don't have much more time. But of course, drug therapy, we have a large number of drugs that can be used in the treatment of hypertension. We have what is called the ACE inhibitors, um, the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, enalapril, lisinopril, covacil, um, the prills, as some people call them. We have the ARBs. The, um, uh, the a ARBs like uh, candesartin, um, uh, ibosartin, <coughs> um, those are the angiotensin angiotensinogen receptor blockers. Um, those, those two groups of drugs are very popular, and they're often used first line in patients with diabetes. Um, but then we have the calcium channel blockers, the diuretics, the beta blockers, the alpha blockers. Um, we have the mineral, uh, mineral corticoids, big, big name, uh, like spironolactone. Um, so, and there are some newer drugs that we don't yet have in Trinidad. I don't have time today to go into uh, which patient should uh, be on which drug. Um, that's an um, individual choice. So when the patient comes in, um, we, we have to look at that patient, look at the risk factors, and, and decide which is the best drug or combination of drugs that that patient uh, might be most appropriate for. I may have to um, come back and um, redo, uh, not redo, but complete this program. I think we may have just about two or three more minutes. Um, yes, three more minutes. Um, so in summary, hypertension, very common. One in four men may have it, one in five females. Um, very often undiagnosed because people think they may have symptoms. Um, we are now emphasizing home readings more or ambulatory blood pressure me measurements. In an office visit, probably about three readings should be taken and then proper investigations should be done and then um, non-pharmacological and pharmacological interventions should be, um, should be done to properly treat uh, our patients. Right, if you have questions, you can WhatsApp your questions on 4824269, 4824269. That's also our office number and um, uh, also information about the church, the Anaposis Chapel. And um, you can um, also uh, follow us on Facebook, the Trinidad and Tobago Anaposis Center. I just wanted to end as I put my pastoral hat on. We have been talking at our church over the last few weeks about the grudge holding offenses. About four weeks ago, um, we talked about small offenses, small things that happen in our life. And we, are, we, we said that if you're on the, on the lookout for an offense, you will be offended. But if you keep those offenses, it will build up into bitterness. And forgiving others is more for yourself than for the, the person you're forgiving. Then we talked about the big offenses, the things that are betrayals, people who are close to you, people who are in your inner circle, and who have driven a knife into your back, those offenses are often more difficult to forgive. But you forgive because, by God's grace, he has forgiven you. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins. And because we are forgiven, we now become people who can forgive others. And then last week, I talked about forgiving God, and that's a one you might be surprised by, but some of us believe that God has forsaken us. God has not come through for us. We have, we've had a delayed response to some of our prayer requests. Two statements I want to leave with you. 
a waiting season isn't a wasted season. And there's a story in 1 Samuel 1. Read it about uh, um, Hannah and Peniel. Hannah was infertile and she had to wait for the promised child. And she was often taunted and she wept bitterly. But her waiting season was not a wasted season because eventually Samuel came into her life with her husband Elkanah. And the last statement I want to leave with you is God's delays are not necessarily God's denials. As you wait upon God, and I encouraged our church and those on Facebook who were following us to do this, as we wait on God, we worship him. And we wait expectantly for the answer to the things that are dear to us. You've been looking at Your Health, Your Choice. Uh, this program will be, be replayed. You can also catch it on Facebook and YouTube. And we will come again with a, another program in two weeks' time. I am Dr. Claude Kahn.